Well, I'm ready. I'm ready for battle. I uh, signed up Friday. I'm being deployed tomorrow. I uh, checked the box that said uh, no basic training needed. It was just that easy. That they tried to give me a weapon, but I said, no thanks. I got my own. I'm ready. I'm, um, I'm going to be serving an M company. M stands for me. I'm going to be a part of Ifantry. I've always been a little awkward leaning into other people and needing people's help. Going there alone on this one. I got my, uh, my ACH. That's Army combat helmet for those of you who don't know it's uh it's attractive don't you think you like it looks good it's a little heavy actually i i i don't know if we're wearing it or not it doesn't seem to to fit quite so well and and, and i've got my i've got my uh, i've got my orange uh safety orange follow wear shirt on you might have noticed see i'm thinking out on a battlefield you want to wear a color like this i don't want any like like friendly fire hitting me or any tanks running over from me from over me from the back i've thought all this through you know i am ready for battle and i'm pretty confident Matter of fact, I would say I'm very confident. And you would say that is very ridiculous. Right? And I would tell you this morning that that's something we want to talk about this morning that is that is very, very real. Something that is 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 very, very serious. And that is this simply: is that as a follower of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, you and I, folks, you and I are in a spiritual battle that we must be ready for. Well, one writer wrote it this way. When you became a follower of Jesus, you established a new relationship with the power of darkness. Whatever you were before you followed Jesus, you are now the sworn foe of the legion of hell. The God inside you terrifies them. But they can seduce you, and they will try. If you play it cool. If you play it cool and decide not to be a fanatic about Christ and your faith, then you will have no trouble from them. But if you are serious about Christ being your Lord, you can certainly expect opposition. Friends, listen. My foe... And your foe is very, very real. And his schemes are very, very serious schemes. Would you do me a favor just a second? Let, let me ask you this question. If you, were, if you were to rate yourself from a one to a four, one being uh, pretty kind of unaware and not thinking much, maybe even a little bit indifferent to spiritual warfare in your life and the schemes of Satan, all right? And how he is trying to trying to constantly take you down versus four being like the you're incredibly aware of it. Where would you be? Would you be a one? A little bit more than a one? Would you be a, a three? Well, would you be one of those people who spends a lot of time thinking about satanic activity and and uh, and and how he's trying and he and his legions are trying to bring you down? C.S. Lewis famously said, "Satan feels as happy." with a Christian whose mind is preoccupied with demons all day long, as he is with one who never, ever gives him a thought. You know, I realized when I was kind of given this topic, as we begin to talk about this idea of follower, what is it that followers of Christ must wear as we continue this journey? I realized that, that this picture kind of depicts a little bit sometimes how our response is, all right? This is a guy, this is a real picture, okay? This is a guy in Canada uh, mowing his lawn <laughs> with 
a large tornado basically in his backyard. When they asked his wife, I guess his wife took the picture and she, and she sent it in, and, and, and here's her comment. I asked him about it, told him he ought to come in, and he said, I'm keeping an eye on it. <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on it. And I have a feeling, I have a feeling that maybe we, you and I are a little bit like that when it comes to spiritual battle, to spiritual warfare, to the things that, that Satan wants to, to, to bring us down to. That our backs are turned and we're going about trying to get the things done today that are on our checklist. All right, I know James likes his checklist, all right? But we're trying to get those things done. At the, at the same time, there is something coming up behind us very, very dangerous. The enemy has his weapons, folks. The enemy has his weapons. Actually, one of the things that hadn't changed about the enemy is his weapons have remained the same. They were, they were there, there in the garden when he went to Adam and Eve. They were there in the desert when Jesus was in the desert. And here are basically the way the, the, the weapons that he uses. And one of the reasons I want to talk about this is we, we talk a bit little later on about some of the, the armor that God has placed, has given us as followers. But I just realized, I realized when I was given this topic that, that it's, it's like the guy in the picture. Sometimes we can be pretty indifferent to spiritual warfare in our life and what Satan is trying to do to take us down. And so I thought maybe it would be good as opposed to just starting with warfare to actually talk a little bit about some of the problems and, and, and some of the dangers and, and how Satan works. Here's a couple of his weapons. He has primarily three, although sometimes he uses a fourth. First of all, he tempts us. He tempts us continuously, doesn't he? Felt tempted in the last 24 hours? Felt tempted in the last 24 minutes or in the last 24 seconds to be distracted from something that you should be paying attention to or not thinking about something that, that you should. He tempts relentlessly. Satan tempts us by offering, in a sense, candy. And, and, and here's one of the things that, that you realize about this temptation. Satan doesn't talk about consequences, does he? He doesn't talk about consequences when he tempts you as a child. He doesn't talk about consequences when he teach, tempts you as a, as a young person. He doesn't, tempt, he doesn't talk about consequences as the older you get. There are no talk. There's no talk ever of the consequences of this behavior. He doesn't talk about collateral damage. He tries his best to keep us from thinking about what might happen in our lives, but not only in our lives, but in the lives of others around you if you will only bite. One of the things I realize about temptation is, is that he will make us, as best he can, blind to the consequences and collateral damage, and he will make us deaf to those who try to talk reason into our lives. Not only does he tempt, but he also accuses. Revelation 12.10 says that he is accuser of the brethren. That's you and I. An accuser of the brethren. Day and night, it says, before God... He accuses us. He is standing before our God, accusing us of, of not really wanting to serve him, of not really being saved by what God has done. And so we have these feelings of guilt. Not all guilt is bad, is it? Some guilt is earned guilt. But when confessed and then continued to be felt, it becomes a guilt that, that just leads us all into kinds of bad things. It robs our joy. And these accusations steal our witness. I, I remember so well. I remember so well being a high school student and, and really being excited about my faith. And Satan began to take some of the things that were going on in my life and some of those temptations. And he began to accuse me. You don't really mean business. Well, why would you be, why would you be sharing Jesus with someone else when he really doesn't even mean that much to me? He stifled me often and often from sharing the faith that Christ had placed in me with other people by these accusations. His purpose in, 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 in these accusations, he wants, to, he wants to take our fellowship. He wants to take the fellowship that we have with God away. Not only does he tempt, and not only does he accuse, but he deceives. He deceives. Listen, listen I read this just the other day in, in, as I was going through the book of John. 
John 8, 44 says, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. Catch this next, this next line. When he lies, Jesus says, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know anybody who, who maybe you might say about them that lying is their native language? The, uh, the, the person that when they tell you about the bass, you have to take a couple inches off. And when they tell you about how much, how much weight they lost in the diet, you have to add a couple pounds. That almost everything they tell you, you've got you to adjust it a little bit. Jesus says Satan is, is, his native language is lying, that there's no truth in him. He is a liar, he says, and he is the father of lies. He shows up really early in the scene, deceiving Eve and deceiving Adam. Let's listen. Satan wants you and I to run. He tempts us, he accuses us, he deceives us. And he wants you and I on the run. He wants us to run after security. He wants you and I to run after safety. And whatever we think brings that in our life. He wants you and I to run after comfort. He wants you and I to run after sex outside the perimeters and bounds that God has set for it. He wants you and I to run for control, grabbing everything we can. He wants us to run from the past. At the core, at the core of Satan's deception is this. He wants you, child. He wants you as a child of God to believe that God does not know your needs. That God does not have the resource to meet your deepest needs. Or that he has the resources and he just won't let them out of your, his hand. And everything that Satan has aimed at us in this area of deception is to create this idea in us that God will not meet or, will, or will not, won't meet the needs that we have. What are you running after? What are you running after? What are you running from? If you've heard yourself say, I've dealt with it. If you hear yourself say, I can overcome that. If you've heard them say, I'm past that. Then you might know that you are on the run to or away from something. Paul gives us a glimpse into this, into this spiritual battle. Uh, this, every once in a while someone speaks, and you know because of their experience, because of their life, their past, that this is a guy you ought to listen to. This is scripture, but God had Paul share this with us. Paul is a person who struggled with spiritual pride because of his genealogy in his life. Paul's a person who had struggled because he had been on the opposite side of the fence from Christianity. Paul had struggled with all these temptations because he was a person with a, a violent past. And here's what he says, Ephesians 6 through, excuse me, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle, he says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul tells us in that passage, not only who our foe is, Paul also tells us the battlefield that we are on. Paul tells us the battlefield. What do you, what do you know about battlefields? Some of you all are history people, some of you are not. I mean, I, I like to read history, and I don't, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not like adept. My, my brother just uh, got his master's in history. That's not, that's not me. But I enjoy reading it. And when I read about history, one of the things I've realized about battlefields is this. That basically, we, the, the battlefields that are famous to us, when you think about Gettysburg, when you think about Normandy, well, when you think about the Battle of the Bulls, you think about battles because of this incredible strategy that they found there, and you think about battlefields because of the casualties that were there. Most of the battlefields that we know, we know they're in our mind, we've read about them because the strategy or the casualties. Satan has his battlefields, folks. Satan has his battlefields. And I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, why it says at the end in, in, in Ephesians 6, it says kind of like this, finally, 
finally, he says, put, put on, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Why this finally? Where are these battlefields for you and I? I mean, we know, we know the weapons that Satan uses. Where are the battlefields? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this. The battlefields that Paul's talking about are primarily in the first five chapters of Ephesians. Well, what is it that he's wanting to get at? Actually, one writer said he's really not interested in you and I so much. He's interested in attacking God. He's interested in attacking God and his kingdom to make sure his kingdom does not advance anymore, that other people aren't saved and brought into the kingdom. But he chooses his battlefields carefully. And those battlefields are found again in those first five chapters of Ephesians. And, and they are presented to us these very battlefields that Satan meets us on are presented to us in the sense of, of gifts. There's a battlefield that I would call this, all right? If you're taking notes, all right? That's not a, uh, that, that's not a mistake. My paw, my paw, P-A, as in my dad, my father. My paw. And I realize it's a little ridiculous, but, but uh, you know, I had to come up with five different P's, and that was one to fit. And the longer that I thought about it, I thought, you know what, I like that. That's a, that's a, that's a term of endearment. Maybe not used so much anymore, but it's a term of warmth. It's, it's, it's a picture of a, of a child who's, who, who wants to, desires to, and is able to sit on dad's lap. It's a warm term. And Ephesians 1, and I believe yours says 1, 3, but it's actually 5 through 6, says this. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Folks, listen. If Satan wants anything, if he wants anything in the way with, with his weapons of, of tempting and accusation and deceit, he wants to somehow convince you that you are not the child, the son or daughter of the king that you are by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if he can get us doubting that, if he can get us doubting our sonship that is ours, not because of anything we did, he has begun to weasel into a place where he will own our heart in some manner. Another battlefield for him is my position. He attacks my position. Ephesians 1, 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. How many of you, how many of you have, have sinned, have done something you knew was disobedient, you knew was not pleasing to the Father, you confessed it, and 30 or 60 or 90 days or 5 or 10 or 15 years later, it is still in the back of your mind and Satan still uses it and you still hear his voice reminding you of that dreadful day, that moment, that time when you chose not to trust. Satan loves. Satan loves not only to take our sonship away, but he loves to take the fact that we are positioned by the side of Christ again through the blood of Christ. And he loves us to get fit, paying attention to our feelings instead of the fact that, that Christ, Christ died so those things would not be a part of us anymore. A battlefield that he loves to roam on is one of of, of, of taking our power from us. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says, it is his incom incomparable power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. His power is in you. You don't have to feel it. It is there. If you have invited Christ into your life, when Christ came into your life, he brought with him the very, very power, the scripture says, that God used when he raised him from the dead. That means all the things that we like to say, I just can't do that. I, I just don't have the strength. I just don't see myself doing that. With all the things that we are scared of, Christ said, I have placed in you by the Holy Spirit a power. And Satan wants to convince us that it is not there. He wants us to feel weak. He wants us to feel fearful. 
He does not want us to be reminded that we have resurrection power in our life to love and to forgive and to do all the things that we do not believe that we had the strength and the power to give. And he loves to remind us, folks, of our past. He loves to remind us of our past. Listen to this, Ephesians 2, 1 and 4 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, verse 4 says, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive again. I talked to a lot of you folks. I talked to, talk to a lot of you. I count so many of you as friends. And, and hate seeing, but see often how many of you have a, are tethered tethered to a mistake, to an identity that you have had in your past that Satan continues to use despite the fact that when Christ died, that tether was cut, that you are no longer in chains. And he will remind us of that, and he will keep that feeling up, and he will keep that guilt, and sometimes it almost feels good because, because we're kind of programmed sometimes that guilt can almost be a good thing. But he keeps us so much. He keeps you from, from being and doing what God has for you to be and do because of those that tether, that chain to the past. And folks, listen. One of his background, ba battlegrounds is, is this. One of his battlegrounds is, is my people. Not only my past, but my people. Listen to what he says in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Instead... Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. He's talking about the body of Christ, the church. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does it work. Do you get that? I mean, do we understand that? That one of the battlefields, one of the, the, the schemes that Satan has, folks, is to take us and separate us from the body of Christ in whatever way he can. Because it's in the body that we grow. It's in the body, the scripture says, that we are supported. And so when we begin to say to ourselves, oh, I'll, I'll get up and make it next week. When we begin to convince ourselves that I can be a Christian, but I don't really have to be a part of the, the a fellowship of believers, folks, listen. That is, I'm just telling you the truth. That is not scriptural. I'm not saying you can't be a Christian. I'm saying God's purpose, God's plan is that you and I be a part of the local body. That we be joined together for the support of other people. Listen, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not an army guy. I've only watched a few movies, had a few conversations with people. And maybe this may be a little bit old as far as, as, as um, uh, the, 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 the style of war. But I've got to tell you, folks, I want somebody in my foxhole. I want somebody in my foxhole. If you're in my foxhole, if you're in my foxhole, I can do my best to help protect you. I can be there for you. I can watch out for you. If you need to rest, I can be there. I can take care of you in a sense. And when I need to rest, or if I get wounded, you can take care of me. But when you leave the foxhole, when you leave those men who are there to help you and support you and guard you, when you're out on your own, folks, you are out on your own. You are vulnerable. And I just say this, and I, golly, I know this is probably going to upset somebody, but, but man, I am amazed. I'm amazed at the number of Christians, followers of Christ, who have somehow decided in their heart, because they are not aware of the Scriptures, how loosely tied, if at all, they can be to the local church. And folks, they are vulnerable. You are vulnerable when you're out there on your own, wandering in every fourth or fifth week just to see what the preacher's preaching and the, and the band's singing. Folks, listen. It's not about being here makes you a Christian. It's about being here gives you protection. And, and being here allows you to be protection and support for someone else. And folks, not only my people, the church, but listen, folks, the people, my family. It is amazing that right before this passage in Ephesians 6, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about family. He's talking about husbands loving wives and loves and wise loving husbands and us taking care of our children. And folks, listen, 
You know, one of the things that I, I talked to Chris Gideon. Chris is a member of our church. He served several, uh, he was deployed several times, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Gave me some great information about warfare. And he was talking about, he was talking about at one point in time that the lead man, the lead man in their squadron, they were, they were, they were trying to get, move out uh, everybody out of some different houses, make sure they were cleared out. And he said his lead man, his lead man opened the door. And as soon as he opened the door, the guy was sitting there in about a 12 by 12 room with an AK-47. He unloaded on this young soldier, hit him in the chest several times. His armor, his armor saved him. It said it broke a couple ribs and knocked the air out of him. And he said, we were able, because we were there, the church was there to pull him out and take care of him. And you know what I was reminded of? I was reminded of the fact that fathers, as fathers, that we are in the lead. That we are the lead man. And that we go into all kinds of intimate territory and we've got to be in front of our children and we've got to be armored up. We've got to be ready. We've got to be ready for Satan to shoot whatever he shoots at us so we can protect those behind us. We have to be ready. That's a battlefield and there's so much to be lost, moms and dads. There's so much to be lost if we are vulnerable at our own and, we are, and we're not putting the armor of God on that God has for us. Folks, the, here's the problem. Here's the problem. The problem is that, that I, I just, and this is true of me, is that sometimes we are, that we are arrogant when it comes to spiritual battle. That, that we want to draw up, we want to do our own thing. We want to believe we have the power. There's this movie that came out a number of years ago now called Mystery Men. And basically the idea of Mystery Men is these guys thought they were superheroes and they think they have superpowers, but in actuality, none of them really do. One has a shovel. One has throws forks. One thinks he makes himself invisible, but he really doesn't. And one just gets really, really angry, but nothing ever really happens. Okay? <laughs> I was laughing a lot more than you are, I know. That's just, I mean, that is so like us, isn't it? I mean, we, that, that, we, that, that Paul says that, that our enemy, our enemy is not of flesh and blood. It is a spiritual power. And we take our forks, and we take our shovels, and we take all our anger, and we take our will... We take our bowling balls and, and we try to fight this spiritual, powerful enemy with these things. And he just laughs and we lose time after time after time. Yeah, you know, when I talked to Chris, I said, Chris, tell me something. When do the most casualties come in war? He said, Steve, they've got all kinds of surveys. They've been studying this for years. The most casualties come in war. The most casualties come in war in the first opening weeks when guys come out of when guys come out or first deployed and essentially they're arrogant. They really haven't tasted what real war is like and they're they're arrogant about what's going to happen, what they're going to do, what they're capable of. And and then they begin to get smarter and casually lessen. And then several a month or so before they go home, they begin to get complacent. And in that complacency the casualties rise again. Folks, listen, we, we often deal with spiritual warfare in a very, very arrogant way, bringing weapons that don't really do anything in spiritual battle, or we get complacent about it. We just don't think about it much. And I just want to, I want you to know this morning that this, my God and your God knows the enemy and knows his schemes. God has given you the perfect weapon to protect the gifts that Satan desires to destroy. The perfect weapon. They fit you perfectly. He knows his schemes, so he knows what weapons, he knows what armor that we need to protect ourselves. So we do not have to be vulnerable every time. We don't have to be vulnerable most of the time. There's no reason for us. Will we fall into temptation sometimes? Yes, we will. Will we be deceived? Yes. But we don't have to. Not if we are putting on what God has us to put on. Here's the things that God has placed in our Uranized lives. He gives us, Paul says, what it's called, he calls the belt of truth. The belt of truth. 
And, 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 a, and a soldier that time, these people would have known that the soldier that time wore a belt. And, and, and on that belt was a sword. And this belt provided certain freedom of movement. Truth brings freedom is the idea there. And he knows that Satan is a cunning liar. Is it any surprise to us that, a, that when our enemy, is, his native language is lying and untruth, that the very first thing that Paul would mention is something regarding the truth, the belt of truth. Basic folks to all your defenses must be an accurate perception of the things, the way things really are. And reality, reality is defined as things the way God sees and reveals them. He, he defines our reality and he gives us truth, the belt of truth. Jesus says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus says in the same chapter, very truly, I tell you, the native language of Satan is lies and the native language of Jesus Christ is truth. He always speaks truth. He speaks nothing but truth. We have to know him to know his truth. He says, I tell you the truth. And I would tell you, that in my counseling and in my dealing with people for these past years, that of our bad behavior and our bad attitudes always spring out of something that you and I believe that is not true about ourselves or others or God. The belt of truth. He also gives us what is called the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is not the imputed righteousness that we have from Christ. This is the righteousness of, of basically of right and wrong. Of, of, of knowing to do the right thing and, and having the heart to do the right thing. And, and, and I read one author that said, your defense against the thrusted spear of accusation by the enemy is the solid assurance that the Father accepts you completely as a result of the death of his Son. The breastplate of righteousness. God gives us a perfect armor. He gives us feet that he says are fitted with readiness. And this is a little bit difficult to understand. This, and, you know, the, the, the Roman soldier that day had a boot that was, they were known for long, long, long heights. And so it was something that would, that would be comfortable over the long haul. It also had, it had some kind of, kind of small spikes in a sense on the bottom of it. So there was a sure footing for the soldier as they were in battle. And folks, listen, you know what? The gospel, the story of Jesus, the gospel that God has given us gives you and I a peace in our heart. And when there comes a peace, there comes in our heart a lack of anxiousness. You can tell a person who has experienced the gospel in his heart fully because there's a lack of anxiousness in there. There's a lack of peace there. They become proactive versus reactive. And the shield of faith. In, in, in that time, the shield of faith was, was basically like, a, like a, this large, um, large uh, two, like a two by four kind of a piece of like several several layers of leather and and you see these you see these uh, uh, you see these movies and stuff where you know the fiery darts were fired you know from the top of the castle and guys lift these things up in front of them basically and it's like a small wall and the idea was not only did it provide protection from height to low they would they would crouch down and they would hold this and it was this incredible wall but they would also if you've probably seen before they would almost attach them to one another and so there was a veritable wall if they were alongside their other people, the army, the church, there was the most protection. When's the last time you decided to be obedient? When's the last time you decided to trust? When's the last time you decided to, to confess or be generous or forgive or serve and the fiery darts of doubt, doubt hit and begin to begin to... to, to Question your motives. Begin to create fear in your heart. The shield of faith is there for you. And the helmet of salvation. Because Satan wants to realize that he can steal our fellowship. And if he can take away our fellowship, he can make us question our relationship with Christ. And if he can make us question our relationship, he can certainly make us question our salvation, whether we even belong to the Lord. Our hope pours out. Our joy pours out. We have to have this helmet of salvation protecting our mind, folks. And last of all, the sword of the Spirit. 
At that time, it was not a long sword that you so often see. It was a shorter sword. It was meant from hand-to-hand combat. I had heard it said it was the only offensive weapon that is listed in this armor of the Lord. And it's important. And folks, he begins with the truth and he ends with the sword of the Spirit, which is the truth, surrounded by truth on both ends. And all of these things happen in our lives. All this armor is based on whether the truth is taking place in our life, whether we are reading truth, whether we are exposed to truth. I had a young man that I knew. I coached soccer when he was five, six, seven years old. His mom recently told me that Tyler's been in battle, been, been in, in army for a number of years and been deployed. When he's going through basic training, he, his mom said that his, that it, that his, his, uh, his commander said, <clears throat> his sergeant said, tomorrow morning when you show up, I want you to bring the most important thing in the world to, for you. The most important thing in the world. At whatever time early the next morning, his entire, his entire um, group showed up and lined up. Everyone else had their rifles. Tyler brought his Bible. And the sergeant says to Tyler, Private Wood, what is that you have in your hand? And he said, you told me to bring the most important thing in the world to me. And this is the most important thing in the world. Pretty gutsy move. How important is it to you? Is it a part of your daily life? Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul says, put on. See, here's the deal. Armor in the container, weapons, weapons in, the, in, in the bin, in the bucket, those things do us, I, I, can, I can say that's what I've got, but, but unless, it is put, unless it is put on, folks, it does us no good. It is interesting to me that in every one of the situations when Paul presents each one of these pieces of, of armor, something to wear, he says, put it on, take it up, buckle it, feet fitted with the readiness. He assumes or he, he makes sure or he understand, that we understand that we have to have these things on in our lives to be able to fight the weapons and the, and, and the, on the battlefield against the enemy. We have got to put it on. Chris told me that years ago when the Black Hawk Down uh, happened, that there was a soldier that supposedly had said, I have no intention to run from the enemy. And so that particular day, he put all his armor on, everything he was supposed to put on except his back armor. And at some point in time, he got separated and isolated from his troop. And he was shot in the back and killed. Put on the full armor, folks. The full armor. Here's, here's what I want to ask you to do. Here's what I want to ask you to do practically. Because this, if, if we don't take action, if we don't do something to put it on, it's just more words in, on a page in the Bible. It's just another illustration. Take up the sword. Let me, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to take 10 minutes each day this next week and read one chapter from the Gospel of John. One chapter from the Gospel of John. If you're not reading anything else, if you've got your own Bible reading program, don't worry. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and open it to the Gospel of John and take 10 minutes and read one chapter. If you only get through half a chapter, and God speaks to you, then you put it down and just think about, okay? But take it up. Act in the facts. Act in the facts. What does that mean? That means that, that so often we are run as believers, we, we become such a feeling society that we allow our faith to be run by feelings. And the truth is, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord, these things are yours. You have been saved. Your conscience has been sprinkled by the blood of of the Lamb. Your, your past has been taken. You've been given a new life. That is the fact. And we have to act sometimes knowing the fact regardless of how we feel. We have to forgive even when we don't feel like forgiving. 
We have to share even when we don't feel like sharing. We act on the facts. Third thing you might do, I would encourage you to do, and that is this. Make a phone call to someone. Make a phone call to someone and get a cup of coffee or get breakfast or have them over, whatever, and say, hey, can we talk battlefields for a second? Because honestly, I really need some help in this area. And share with them, the, the, share with them the, the weapon that Satan is using just to whip your rear right now. Share with them the battlefield that he has on you that he is really gaining some victories. Ask them what theirs are. And share that and, 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 and join together your shields of faith. Stand by one another. Be in one another's foxhole. Make that phone call because, folks, I'm going to tell you, you and I cannot do this alone. We cannot win spiritual battles on our, by ourselves. It will not happen. Satan, Satan wants us to believe if you are not a child of the king, he wants you to believe that you are. And if you are a child of the king, he wants to believe you to believe that you aren't. This is a decision time. And my decision, in, in the, 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 what I ask of you is this. What I believe God wants you to do is first is to sign up to, to receive what Christ has done for you on the cross, to be a part of what God has for you, to become a part of a place that can support you and that can be in a foxhole with you and where, where we can help protect you and help you grow. We can be joined together and support one another. That's what this decision time is about. We invite you to come, to ask questions, to make a decision, to become a part of this church and become a part of Christ and what he has for you. Let's stand and sing together.